Well, I want to wish all of you a happy Resurrection Sunday. Uh, man, I, I just am so thankful that, uh, that, that you guys out there that are watching have chosen uh, to allow Crossroads uh, here to, to be a part of your Easter Sunday and your Resurrection Sunday. It is an honor and a privilege for us to be able to be with you uh, by way of video, and uh, we appreciate you watching and uh, studying the Bible with us as we learn the Bible today. And uh, you know what? We can celebrate the resurrection of Christ wherever we are. I mean, whether it's in church, whether it is in your living room, bedroom, uh, patio, porch, we can celebrate Christ wherever we are. And, and that's what we want to do. And you know that, that video you just saw for the kids about Thomas goes along so well with what I want to be teaching on today about Christ's resurrection. Uh, of course, Thomas was one of the 12 disciples, and he's famously known as Doubting Thomas. You hear that expression to this day. You hear the expression Doubting Thomas, and we're going to see why he got that nickname this morning. Um, you know, maybe you have a nickname, and maybe you like it, maybe you don't like it, uh, but I doubt if Thomas liked that nickname, Doubting Thomas, uh, if people called him that when he was alive, uh, because we're going to see this morning that there was a lot more to Thomas uh, than just the fact that he doubted Christ's resurrection. Uh, Thomas was just like the rest of us. You know, he had good traits and bad traits, and nobody is one-dimensionally good or evil. Uh, we're all kind of a mixed bag. And this year, uh, if if you know, if you've been at Crossroads or if you've been kind of watching online, you know that we've been studying the 12 disciples of Christ a lot this year, and we've learned a lot from them. We've, we, we learned, first of all, that none of them were perfect. None of them were all put together. They were ordinary guys, farmers, tax collectors, fishermen, and the 12 disciples, they all had issues. They all had struggles, just like the rest of us. But Jesus loved them, and Jesus wanted them, and Jesus called them uh, to be close to him. They were his family on earth, and they were the guys that he mentored and trained. And Jesus loved Thomas. Uh, Thomas was one of the 12, and, and Jesus loved him, despite his faults and his failures. And we're going to see that that Jesus was so tender and he was so kind, even when Thomas was at the lowest point of his life. I mean, when Thomas was at rock bottom with serious doubts and, and serious questions, Jesus loved Thomas through that. And, and you know, you may uh, be watching this and listening to this, and and maybe maybe you uh, have have trusted Christ. Maybe you uh, have been a believer in Christ, but it could be that maybe others have kind of shaken your faith, kind of shaken your foundation. So now you don't really know what you believe. You know, you're just kind of confused. And and hey, that was Thomas. You know, um, maybe you're you're watching this and, you know, you're a skeptic. Uh, you're, not, you're not a believer in Christ yet. You know, you've got some serious doubts about the whole thing. Well, you know, again, Thomas, he was a skeptic. Uh, but one thing that we're going to see is that Jesus loves the doubting Thomases of the world. Jesus will be glad to prove to you what truth really is if you're open-minded and if you will let him. By the way, I'll just mention this, that uh, Thomas ended up getting past his doubts, and Thomas ended up going on to become uh, an incredible, powerful witness for Jesus Christ, and pointed other people to Christ, and led other people to Christ. Uh, there, there's three, there's not a whole lot in the Bible about Thomas, but there are three specific events recorded in the Bible. They happen to all be in the book of John. If you want to be turning to John chapter 11, I hope you'll turn in your Bible or get your iPad or get your, uh, your, your phone and, and get John chapter 11 because um, I want to show you three events where Thomas is specifically mentioned and where Thomas speaks. And in all three of the biblical accounts of Thomas's life, all three times, he's skeptical. He's a skeptic. But Jesus is not intimidated by that at all. Jesus 
gave Thomas some very solid proof and some really solid answers. And so we're going to look at each of these three accounts of Thomas's life, and we're going to see that, that each time Jesus proved something to Thomas uh, that Thomas was skeptical about. Uh, The first one is in John chapter 11, if you want to be turning in your Bible there, to John chapter number 11. And uh, the the first thing that Jesus proved to Thomas is this. He proved to Thomas that death can be beat. That's the first thing that we're going to learn. Death can be beat. To kind of give you the the context here, a very good friend of Jesus Christ and the disciples was very sick. His name was Lazarus. And he and his sisters lived in the city of Bethany, which was like a suburb of Jerusalem. And they sent word to Jesus, who was not close to there at all. They, they got word to Jesus that, hey, the guy that you love, your friend Lazarus, the one that you love, he's very, very sick. And they called for you know, Jesus to come. And of course, that's never a message that you want to get, especially right now with the coronavirus. None of us want to get that phone call that one of our loved ones has, uh, has become very sick. Uh, and, and I want you to know that Crossroads, as our, we love you, and you're our flock. And I know that uh, myself and the other pastors, we're praying for our flock. We're praying for your family. We're praying for you. And uh, we are praying, uh, you know, that God will give you grace and strength right now during this time. Because uh, we don't, none of us want to get that, that message, right, that our loved ones are sick. But Jesus gets that message that Lazarus, his friend, is very, very sick. Well, here is the problem, though. Jesus had left Jerusalem because they had tried to take him there and kill him. His life literally was threatened there. So Jesus had left, and Jesus had gone uh, to um, a wilderness area out by the Jordan River. And Jesus was having an extremely fruitful and effective ministry there. Uh, People were coming to him in droves, and they were believing on him and trusting in him. Their lives were being radically changed. And so he's having this very fruitful, effective ministry. And then he gets this word about Lazarus. And so two days go by, and Jesus then tells the 12, he says, guys, let's go back to Judea. Well, Judea, that's Jerusalem area. And so right away, the 12 are like, whoa, hold on. They're like, Jesus, what are you talking about? You know, go back to Jerusalem. You want to go back there again? That's where they were going to kill you. That's where they tried to to take you and kill you. And you want to go back there again? Well, the 12 didn't want to go back there, and for good reason. I mean, would you want to go someplace where people were trying to kill you? And so they try to, you know, talk Jesus out of it. And, and it was when Jesus, it was when he insisted on going back, that's when we hear from Thomas. And so I want you to take your Bible, go to John 11, and look at verse number 16, because this is one of those rare times where we get to hear from Thomas. And so look at John 11 and verse number 16. It says, then Thomas, who is called Didymus, said to his fellow disciples, let us go also that we may die with him. (laughs) Don't you love his optimism, right? Uh, Come on, guys. If Jesus is going to die, let's go die with him. And one of the things that we're going to learn about Thomas is that Thomas was a, was a pessimist by nature. Uh, but at least here it's a, it's a heroic pessimism. But, but Thomas was convinced that they were all heading for a stoning and that they were all heading for destruction. But he was totally devoted to Jesus. He loved Jesus so much that, that he didn't want to live without Jesus. So he's like, guys, come on, let's go. Let's just go die with him. Better, better to die with him than to be left behind. And that was his heart. You know, Thomas was going to follow Jesus no matter what. Well, little did he know that he was about to see Jesus Christ in a way like he had never seen Jesus before. Now, by the time they get back there to Bethany, which is by Jerusalem, Lazarus had already died. In fact, Lazarus had been dead four days By the time they get there, I mean, he's already died. They've already had, you know, funeral services for him, and they've already put him in a tomb and sealed the tomb. 
So this guy, he's been dead for four days by the time Jesus gets there. And so Jesus tells him to roll the stone away. And uh, let's, let's kind of pick up the story there. Look with me at John chapter number 11 and look at verse number 39. Verse number 39. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there's a stench. She said, for he's been dead four days. She's like, you don't want to roll away that stone from there. She said, you know, there's already going to be a, a terrible foul odor. He's been dead for four days. And then in verse number 40, Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed that you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying. Jesus lifted up his eyes and, and he said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I know that you always hear me. But because of the people standing around, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. He who was dead came out, his hands and feet wrapped with grave clothes and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. <laughs> I, this is mind-boggling, right? It's like Jesus says, Lazarus, come out. And all of a sudden, I mean, they, they got the guy wrapped up like a mummy in his grave clothes. And he, and he comes out, you know, like this, all bound with his, his hands and feet with his grave clothes on. And Jesus is like, man, you know, turn, turn the guy loose. Get those grave clothes off of him. And Lazarus is completely well. Can you imagine the gasps that came from the crowd? Because this was done in the open in front of hundreds of witnesses. In fact, the Bible says, of course, that many believed on Jesus that day. Now, let's go back to Thomas. Thomas was convinced, right? He was convinced that they were going to all be dead. He said, come on, guys, let's go. Let's go then. If he's determined to go, let's go that we can die with him. Thomas was convinced that, that they're all going to be dead. Well, not only was Jesus still alive, not only were the 12 still alive, Lazarus is alive. <laughs> I mean, not, not only did they not die, they gained one. <laughs> they gained one. And so, lesson learned, doubting Thomas. When you're with Jesus, death can be beat. You can escape death. Death has no power over Jesus Christ. And you know what? Right now, some of you that are listening, you may fear death. And uh, that, that's understandable. I mean, right now, I think death is more on kind of everyone's radar than ever before. And, you know, some people are downright afraid. Some people are panicked. And uh, the coronavirus has a lot of people scared to death, you know. I mean, they are just scared. They're fearful. They're afraid to die. What I, what I want to say to you is this. There is no need to fear death when you know Jesus. There is no need to fear death when you have Jesus with you. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 1.10 that Christ abolished death and he brought life and immortality to light through what he did for us. And so Thomas, doubting Thomas, skeptical Thomas, let's just all go die with him. He got a lesson that, that, that Jesus gave him that day, and that is that death can be beat. But there's a second lesson that he learned, and that's this. Jesus proved to Thomas that the resurrection is real. The resurrection is real. What we're going to do is we're going to fast forward to the night that Christ was arrested and crucified. We're going to fast forward to that night when they came there in the garden and they put the handcuffs on Jesus, they led him away, and then they eventually took him out and they crucified him outside Jerusalem. And if you have your Bible, I want you to go forward to John chapter number 20, and I'm going to turn there too. And the Bible says this, the Bible says that the night that all this happened, the disciples forsook Jesus and fled. I mean, they flew the coop. They, 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 when crunch time came, they were gone. For whatever reason, the courage they had in, in John 11 had dissipated, 
And, and so now when the rubber meets the road, they put their tail between their legs and they ran for their lives, Thomas included. Judas Iscariot, who betrayed Christ, he killed himself. And so that left 11 of the 12 disciples. Well, now let's fast forward three days later to Sunday, just like today, first day of the week. And it's Sunday and all the disciples get together and they're in a locked room. I mean, they're in a locked room for fear of the Jews. They're afraid they're going to be next. And so they're, they're in lockdown, just like us, right? They're in lockdown. And, and so they're in this room. They're scared to death that they're going to be crucified next. And, you know, they're in this room and, and in the upper room. And I'm sure they're, they're crying. They're sorrowing. They're grieving. They're comforting each other. They're talking. And they're probably like, okay, you know, where, where do we go from here? Uh, you know, what do we do next? What's the game plan? Uh, they're going through the same emotions and the, and the same grief process that we would go through when we lose a loved one. And everybody was there except one guy. And that was Thomas. Why wasn't Thomas there? The Bible doesn't say. They were all there except Thomas. I think we can kind of read between the lines though. And we know that, that from the three examples of Thomas in the Bible, we know that Thomas appears to be a very pessimistic, melancholy type of guy. And so I'm guessing that he was probably in no mood to be around people. He wanted to be alone. He wanted to be able to think. He wanted to be able to grieve in his own way. He wanted to be able to process uh, all of what happened, you know, and, and, you know, he wanted to be able to figure out where do I go from here? What am I going to do? Am I going to go back to my old job? And, you know, what, what am I going to do? And, and maybe you're that way. Maybe when, you're, when you are melancholy, you don't want to be around people, right? And that's how Thomas was. Thomas didn't want to be around people. So, so while the 10 are in the upper room, guess who showed up? Look at verse 19, John 20 and verse number 19. It says, on the evening of that first day of the week, on Sunday, the doors being locked where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst, and he said to them, peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands, right, where the nails had been, showed him his side where they'd pierced him with the sword, and the Bible says that the disciples were then glad when they saw the Lord. I mean, can you imagine how thrilled they were? Can you imagine how excited and ecstatic they were? Jesus is alive. He's alive. And don't you know, man, they couldn't wait to tell Thomas. Thomas was the only one missing. And they're so excited. And they tell Thomas. And I'm sure to their surprise, Thomas wasn't having any part of it. Remember, Thomas was a pessimist. And so Thomas, he, he's not having any part of it. He doesn't believe him. He's thinking probably things like, well, maybe he thought they were seeing things, imagining things, wishful thinking. He's thinking maybe they dreamed it. He's thinking, well, you know, they just know I'm so depressed and they know how melancholy I am. And so they're just trying to cheer me up. You know, he, maybe he thought that, he thought, well, maybe Jesus did appear to them all in a dream. Maybe they all had the same dream and Jesus appeared to them in their dreams. But, but, but Thomas is thinking it could not have literally been Jesus Christ in the room with them because he's in the tomb over there. I saw him die. I saw them. He's in that tomb. So it couldn't have been him. Well, that all led to verse 25. So let's go ahead and, and go down there. In verse 25, it says, so the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail prints in his hands and put my finger in the nail prints, he says, and put my hand in his side, I will not believe. That's where he gets the name Doubting Thomas. You know, I was thinking he must have been from Missouri uh, because, you know, <laughs> Missouri, I'm from Missouri, and Missouri is called the show me state. They put that on the license plates, you know, and a lot of people don't know what that means. Why is Missouri called the show me state? 
And the reason why that it's called that is because people from Missouri were known historically as being very stubborn, very hard-headed, uh, doubters, skeptics. Uh, that Their attitude was, don't just tell me, you're going to have to show me. I'm not going to believe until you show me. And that's how it got. Show me state. You say, well, you know, hey, Pastor Dan, you're from Missouri, born and raised there. Is that true? Are people from Missouri hard-headed and are they stubborn? You, you know, I'm going to let you ask my wife that. Uh, <laughs> Denise has been going to Missouri with me uh, for years now, for over 30 years. She's been going back and forth. So, you know, I'm going to let you ask her that. I hate to talk about my own kind, you know. So I'm going to let you uh, talk to Denise, and when you see her next time, you can ask her if people from Missouri uh, are really hard-headed and stubborn. But this is Thomas. You know, he's hard-headed. He's stubborn. He's like, I'm not going to believe it unless, you sh unless I see it with my own eyes. Well, that's Thomas's attitude. And, and so eight days go by. Eight days go by, and Thomas' grief must have subsided a little bit because now he's with the, with the 10 in that same upper room. So now he's with the 10, all 11 of them are together, and guess who showed up? Guess who showed up eight days later? Look at verse number 26. It says, after eight days, his disciples were again inside with the door shut, and Thomas was with them. Jesus came and said, Jesus came and stood among them, and he said, peace be with you. Right after the greetings, right after Jesus says, peace be with you, he turns his eyes and he looks right at Thomas, and he looks Thomas right in the eyeballs. Eyeball to eyeball. I mean, he zones in on Thomas. And I want you to notice what he said to him. Look at verse number 27. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and look at my hands. Put your hand here and place it in my side. Do not be faithless but believing. And I love how tender and I love how kind Jesus is with Thomas. He's so loving. He doesn't go off on him. He doesn't, he doesn't chew him out. He doesn't you know, tell him, you have forfeited your right to be my disciple. I'm ashamed of you, Thomas. He doesn't give him this big, long lecture and humiliate him in front of his peers. He knew what Thomas had said. And so Jesus is like, Thomas, you said that this is what you wanted to see. Well, here you go, buddy. Here's my hands. Feel my side. It's me. It's really me, Thomas. And I love Thomas's reaction. Thomas was a skeptic, but Thomas was a humble man that knew when he had been wrong. And Thomas knew how wrong he had been. And Thomas completely humbles himself, and he bows before Christ, and, and, and he exclaims one of the greatest and simplest proclamations of Christ's deity ever recorded in the Bible. Look at verse number 29. Thomas answered him, verse 28, I'm sorry, verse 28, Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. He said, Jesus, you are the Lord. Jesus, you are deity. You are God. And then I want you to look at Jesus' words in verse 29. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and have yet believed. You know, Jesus just described the millions of people who would believe in him the next 2,000 years all the way up to today. But I want you to know that we do not believe in Christ blindly. Because if you think that we do, you're wrong. We have something that Thomas didn't even have. 
And that is that we have mounds and mounds of manuscript evidence over 5,500, over 5,500 old Greek manuscripts from different centuries, and they all agree. I mean, tons and tons of eyewitnesses have given testimony, and it's all recorded in black and white, that Christ is alive. Thomas and all of the 11 disciples would eventually die for that testimony. I mean, Thomas and the 11, they gave their life for the firm conviction that yes, Christ is alive and we are not going to deny that. There's no hoax, you know? I mean, look, you know, 11 guys don't all give their lives for a hoax. They knew that he was alive. And so if you're listening to this video right now, it could be that you're a doubting Thomas. And what I want to say is this, I want to say this, that it's fine to doubt religion. Listen, there's a lot of corrupt religion out there. There's a lot of religion that's leading people astray, and, uh, and, and there's a lot of bad religion out there. So it's fine to doubt religion. And you know what? You may doubt preachers. That's fine too. I'm a preacher, but look, I know better than anybody. I'm human. I'm a sinner like everybody else. I make mistakes. And you know what? There's some, there's some corrupt preachers out there, just like there's bad doctors and just like there's bad lawyers and just like there's, you know, bad politicians. They're bad preachers too, right? And so, uh, you know what? It's fine to doubt preachers. It may be that you doubt churches and that's fine because again, there's bad churches, you know, and, and so that's fine. You can doubt religion, and you can doubt preachers, and you can doubt churches, but there is no reason for you to doubt Christ and his resurrection from the dead. There is no logical, sensical reason for you to doubt Jesus Christ and his resurrection from the dead. If you take the time to examine the overwhelming evidence you're going to come to the logical conclusion that Jesus did, in fact, beat death. He did rise from the dead. I think I told you guys last year about uh, an award-winning author by the name of Lee Strobel. And Lee Strobel was a very, very staunch atheist. And he was an investigative journalist for the Chicago Tribune. He was an award-winning journalist. He had, uh, he had won prizes. He had worked for, you know, I think all kinds of different newspapers. And, and he had done this for 14 years. And his wife became a Christian. And I mean, it just absolutely uh, just bothered him. And I mean, it, it just blew his mind. He could not believe that his wife had become a Christian. I mean, it was just, uh, just bothered him so bad that, that he decided that he would take months, okay, to, to completely, just like a, a, an investigative journalist would investigate a story, he was going to investigate the biblical claims about Christ. And of course, his purpose was so that he could, you know, disprove it and, you know, uh, show his wife, you know, how wrong she was. Well, prompted by the results of his investigation, he became a Christ follower. He became a Christian at the age of 29 years old. And he's written some incredible books, of course, called, one's called Case for Christ. Uh, and, um, and, and he kind of in that book goes through the whole process of what he went through when he was investigating. There's a movie that was made about his life. And, you know, that is so true. But, you know, I think about Crossroads and Right here in our church, we have a lot of former atheists. In fact, I've met several just this year that were former atheists that have recently come to faith in Jesus Christ. And, uh, and, and one of those, his name is Devin. He's a young man. And this young man was a staunch atheist. And now he is a strong and passionate believer in Jesus Christ. And I wanted him to be able to kind of just share with you his story. So what we're going to do is we're going to show you a quick video about Devin and his journey and his story about how he went from an atheist to being a passionate follower of Jesus Christ. And then uh, when this video is over, I'm going to come back and I'm going to give you one final quick thought about Thomas and what he learned about the way to heaven and the way to to eternal life. And so we're going to come back and we're going to finish this up. But first, I want you to watch this testimony from a young man in our church named Devin.
I was raised in a predominantly atheist, agnostic household. My father was a biologist, a, a man of science. He believed that everything could be explained with a rhyme and a reason, and that you know, a Big Bang Theory evolution, that was all that there was, and that was how it was going to be. So I took it like that. Uh, until I got into my early teenage years, adolescent, I began to think that there must be more than this. There's no way that we're just a collection of atoms. We're not just a series of electrical impulses contained in a big meat sack flying around the earth as it spirals towards oblivion. So I started to think to myself, what else is there? Why, why are we here? What, what purpose do I have? Uh, why should I care? Why, why do I need to get out of bed every day and care about others? Why can't I just live for myself? And so I started to seek. I started to look into the various other religions of the world. I looked at Eastern Buddhism and Taoism that showed us that we were all raw silk and uncut wood and in the hands of a master we could truly become something. The teachings of karma that said if I do good things then good things will happen. If I do bad things, bad things will happen to me. And that didn't sit very well with me because I looked around the world and I saw warmongers and drug lords that would be living their entire life doing terrible, terrible things and there was just absolutely no justice, no right for that wrong. So that didn't sit well with me. I then looked into Hinduism and, and how would they believe that reincarnation that whatever I do in this life will translate to a better life in the next eventually leading towards an inevitable nirvana or whatever you want to call it and I didn't like that either because if I don't remember the person behind me and I certainly don't remember the person after me then why should I care what what does it benefit me to not live selfishly now and I even ran into a couple close encounters with Christianity where I would be Usually in the wrong setting, I would be in a bar somewhere talking to a Christian with a beer in their hand and curse words in their mouth. And they would be sitting here trying to tell me about Jesus and the gospel and love and all these different things. And I had these hard questions that I would bring to them, you know, things like, if God is all good, then where did the evil come from? And why does God allow suffering in the world if he truly does care about us? And, and all these different, and they would inevitably, after trying to give me a, a short answer, say, you know, because you don't believe, you can't understand. And, and I would press them harder and try to find more truth in the, into their questions. And they would look at me and say, listen, you just have to believe, otherwise you'll never understand. And I didn't like that. I, I, I called it, they, they hid in their corner of faith, and I brushed it to the side and said, you know, that they don't have any, any more answers than I do. And so I went through my teenage years feeling that there was no truth, no answer, and I never had peace. And it sent me to this spiraling existential crisis. It put me into this deep state of depression and anguish where I didn't understand or didn't care to understand why I was here and I chose to mask it. I tried to cope and numb myself inside of me with, with drugs and alcohol and meaningless relationships and just whatever I could. I, I was intent on being a professional burnout because if nothing matters, we, we came from nothing, we're going to turn into nothing, then I'm going to enjoy my 60 years the best I can do and cope with that anguish that I felt inside as a result. So fast forward a few years, um, I got a job as a nurse, I started working at a nursing home on the, on the same floor as who my now wife is, Kirby, was working and before we had any conversation, before I ever even got to know her, I didn't notice there was something different about her. I noticed that because me and the other nurses would be at the nurse's station talking about what we did last weekend our relationships, our drinking, whatever it was, we were cursing. She was set apart. She was aside from us, not engaging in those same conversations. She didn't have the same mindset, the same mentality. And that always interested me. Well, come to find out, she was a Christian. Um, so I would always take report from her. I would be coming on, she'd be going off, we shared the same cart. So we had lots of conversations over the course of about two years. And we talked about love, life, pursuit of happiness. And above all, what really got me was science. This was the first time that I ever come in such close contact with a Christian that had answers and who was strong in her faith and, and had an answer and something that was not just based in, in faith or belief or her, you know, that corner of faith that I was, I was saying earlier. And one day she looks at me and says, you cannot believe in the theory of evolution, the Big Bang Theory, if you also believe in the second law of thermodynamics. And that says that the level of entropy increases over time. And that just means chaos, that from the beginning of time to the way we are now, things should be getting more chaotic, not more orderly. So you can either believe in the theory of evolution or you can believe in the law of thermodynamics. And I looked at her and I said, you know what? I don't have enough to talk to you about that right now, but I'm going to go home and look it up. And I went home thinking to myself, 
just like every other Christian that I ever run into in the bar and wherever I was, I was going to poke holes in their faith and poke holes in their ideas to show them that they didn't know anything about what they were talking about, just like I didn't know what I was talking about. So I went home and looked it up, and lo and behold, this is a very big controversial thing, and there was so much evidence, so many studies done trying to prove it, and nothing had come close to being able to explain why that happens. It was chalked up to the, what they called the chaos theory, another theory, when I was here searching for the truth. So I went back to her and I said, and I, and I was amazed that this was like, for the first time in my life, science and the Bible had coincided. And I just, I thought they were enemies. I thought they were at odds. And here they were coming together in a point. And she would send me these long, drawn out, thought out messages about Genesis and the origin of the world. In the beginning, God talks about time, space, and matter. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And all of these, and she would send me resources and, and long posts to read about. And time and time again, I would leave her on read because it was a lot. It was too much for me to manage at one point. I needed time to meditate on it. When I would lay awake at night and my girlfriend would be passed out drunk in the bed next to me and, and I was left to my own thoughts and I was being eaten alive by these same thoughts of hopelessness and, and su suffering in the world and these deep questions of why should I care? Who am I and what is my purpose on this earth? Back to what I felt when I was an early teen. So after a while of me leaving her on red and her continuing to try to convince me that science and the Bible are the same thing, she looked at me and she said, listen buddy, we're in America, there's a Bible on every street corner, if you want to know about Jesus and the origin of the universe, you can pick up a Bible and read it for it yourself. And so I said, okay. Um, so I went to my mom's house and I asked her if she still had her Bible from when she was in grade school and she, and she did it. And I started reading it and I sat down, I must have read. 40, 50 chapters of Genesis in one sitting. And I mean, I was just tearing through these pages and it was starting to make sense. I was starting to understand the logic. I was seeing the cross references and things and I was so excited about it all, but I never really did anything with it. I just kind of saw it was some, some truth to be had in it. Fast forward a few weeks and I was sitting at the nurse's station charting and then randomly, I don't know where the thought came from, but randomly I said out loud, I don't think I want to get married. And, and keep in mind that I was the same person that Kirby had come to know for the last two years with long greasy hair, I was a dirty hippie, like I, I was the furthest thing from ready for marriage. And she turned around in her seat and said, you think, you think you want to get married? How many sermons have you read? How many books have you uh, read? How many seminars have you been to? You know, if you were a doctor and, and yeah, we, I came in with a broken leg and you said, hop up here, let me operate on you, you'd say, what school did you go to? How many clinical hours do you have? How, how many surgeries have you performed? It's people like you that the divorce rate in our country is so high because you want to just waltz into marriage and expect everything to work out and never having invested a single hour. And I said, I thought I was. Um, so so where, where do you think I should start? Where do you think I should? And so she said, well, I have a couple books I could recommend. I said, no, I don't really read. I don't really like reading. She said, all right, well, I have a good sermon series I could send you. So I said, yeah, maybe, maybe send me the sermon series. I'll, I'll, I'll watch a video or two. That's, that's fine. And it was this series called Kingdom Man. Um, so I started watching this series and, and it was amazing. It was not only about these revolutionary principles of how to be a man, how to lead a family, what vision was. It was talking to me about purpose. It was talking to me about human suffering. It was talking to me about science and the Bible. It was talking to me about everything that I had ever searched for was contained in a series about marriage. Something I never would have thought to look at before. And so all the while I was watching these sermons, I was reading my Bible, I was reading in the New Testament, and it just started to make so much sense to me, like a light was coming on in my mind that I was noticing all the similarities amongst everything. And I, and I called Kirby up one day and I was talking a million miles a minute and I said, you, like, oh my goodness, it all makes, finally makes so much sense to me. And I said, I believe, it's great, I believe. And she said, okay, now what are you gonna do with that information? And I said, what do you mean? I believed, I thought that's what you had to do. You had to like believe and that was, that was it. And she said, well, no. If you and I have an argument, and I go over to my sister, and I look at her and I say, man, I'm real sorry about what happened between me and Devin. Well, that doesn't change anything between your and I's relationship. I still have to go back to you and apologize and reconcile that relationship. And in the same way, I had to go do that with God. And so a couple days, I'm wrestling in my spirit. Is this something that I really want to do? It was so hard for me to finally surrender in that moment to God. But I finally did do it. I finally did confess to God that I am a sinner and I believe that you sent your son to die on the cross for my sins and I am saved by that grace. And I felt so 
warm. I felt such a relief, such a burden lift off of my chest in that moment. I cannot describe the freedom I felt. Every, every worry, every doubt, every fear and anxiety that I had held in for so long in a moment been released in me. And so next time I saw Kirby, I told her and I was so excited that it had happened. And she said to me, cool, I'm really happy that that all happened to you, but now what are you going to do? I said, what do you mean? I'm reading my Bible. I'm doing that prayer thing that we were talking about. I uh, talked to God, had that conversation. He said, no, you, wanna, you need to get plugged into a church. You need to grow. And, and so I did. So I found a church and I started going to church. And then uh, she said, all right, so um, now what are you going to do? And I said, well, what do you mean? What am I going to do? I, I've done everything that I'm supposed to do. I, I read my Bible. I had that conversation with God. I'm praying. I'm going to church. What more could the... You know, she said, you need to get plugged into a small group, a life group. You need to start finding a ministry to serve in. Uh, take that grace that God has given unto you and, and serve back to the community. And so I did, and so I started doing that. But I never would have done any of those things had I never been in close contact with a person, a Christian, a believer, that not only had faith and unwavering moral principles, but had a heart to not back down and to, to honestly say to me, I care about you and, and where you're going and the path that you're on now. And because I serve a God that is exceedingly abundantly above all that I could ever ask or think, not only did I get saved and I get freed from my vice of drugs and alcohol, but I also got a wife and a daughter and another on the way. And I just honestly pray that if anyone out there ever gets the chance to be in close enough proximity to an earnestly seeking atheist, agnostic, whatever they want to call themselves, that you have an answer for your faith, that you do not just believe because you simply believe, that you honestly know in your heart of hearts that this is the truth, the way, and the light. And it's not easy. It's not supposed to be easy. No one ever told us it was going to be easy. But I wouldn't stand before you the man I am today if it wasn't for the faith of somebody who believed. What a fantastic testimony from just a passionate young man for Christ. And, uh, you know, I hope that when we start meeting and having our gatherings together again, that you'll be able to meet Devin and, and just let him know how much you appreciate that testimony that he has for Christ. I know he shared that at different events at our church, and boy, it's just been a blessing. And, uh, you know, he, he was a doubting Thomas, right? And uh, just like Thomas came to faith in Christ and said, my Lord and my God, so many have done the same thing. And, you know, the last thing that I wanted to share with you is this. There's one other story about Thomas in the Bible where he speaks, and that's in John 14, if you want to turn over there. And this is, this is the last thing that Jesus proved to Thomas, and that's this. Jesus proved to Thomas that heaven can be found. Heaven can be found. In John chapter 14 and verses 1 through 4, Jesus is attempting to encourage the disciples, knowing that he would soon be dying on the cross for the sins of the world, that he'd be leaving them, that he'd be ascending back up into heaven. And, and so he, he starts to talk to them about his father's house, and he's talking about heaven. And he says, don't let your hearts be troubled. He says, if you believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. In my father's house, there's many dwelling places. There's room for you, you know? And he says, if it wasn't so, I, I would have told you. And he says, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And he said, if I prepare a place for you, I'm going to come and I'm going to receive you unto myself. That, that where I am, Jesus said, you may be also. Well, it's, it's right after that that we hear from Thomas again. Look at verse number five, John 14, verse five. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? And so good old Thomas, the eternal pessimist, he's like, Jesus, you're going to leave us and we're going to wander around lost and we're going to have no clue on how to get, you know, where you are. And I love Jesus' answer to Thomas. And again, Jesus doesn't reprimand him. He doesn't embarrass him. He just gives Thomas a straightforward answer. Look at verse number six. Jesus said to him, said to Thomas, I am the way, the truth, and the life. 
No one comes to the Father except through me. Boy, I tell you, that's pretty clear, isn't it? Jesus is the way to heaven. Tom, Thomas is like, how, do, how can we know the way to heaven? You know, we're, we, we don't, we're not going to be able to get to you once you're gone. Jesus said, no, I am the way. I am the way to heaven. And he is because Jesus is truth and Jesus is life. And he proved that when he rose from the dead. There's no doubt about it. Listen, had Jesus stayed dead, if we were talking today about uh, a man named Jesus and, and they, they, we can go and visit his tomb and, and know he's in there and his body's in there, then you know what? We would have every reason to doubt. But there's no doubt about it because he rose from the dead. And that's what we're celebrating today on Easter. And Jesus invites each person to come to him and to enter into a relationship with him. It's all about a relationship he wants with you. Not religion. It's about a relationship. And when you know Christ personally and when you have trusted in him, your relationship with Christ is going to culminate with you being with him in heaven. You are going to be with him for all eternity. In fact, Jesus said it this way in John chapter 3 and verse number 15. He said that, who, this is Jesus' words, that whosoever believes in him, in Jesus, should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world, Jesus said that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever, whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. You see, Thomas was pessimistic. He was skeptical by nature, but he was also fair and open-minded. When Jesus presented him with truth, he did not pridefully hang on to his preconceived ideas and opinions. He believed. He said, my Lord and my God. And so the question that I want to pose to all of you who may be watching right now is this. Has there ever come a, a time in your life when you have believed on Christ? Because if you've never believed on him and trusted in him, you can do that right now. And it's like I said earlier, you can doubt religion, you can doubt preachers, you can doubt churches, but don't doubt Christ. He died for your sins on the cross. He rose from the dead so that he could give you his life. And there's no reason for you to doubt him. And if you want to trust in Jesus Christ, you can do that right now, you know, and if you're not ready for that right now, that's fine. You can talk to somebody about that. You can call our church office. You can email us. You can, you can, uh, you know, stop by, uh, any of that. We'd be glad to sit down and talk with you. Um, you know, it, and I know there's a lot of people here that would love to sit down and talk to you about it, but maybe you're ready. Maybe you're like, no, I'm, I'm ready. I, I really want to believe on Christ. I, I want to trust him as my savior. I want to be saved and forgiven of my sins. And I do believe that he died and I do believe he rose from the dead. And so if you would like to trust Christ as your savior, you can do that right now. And, uh, I'm going to pray a, a prayer of salvation, a sinner's prayer, if you will. And if you'd like to pray that with me, you can pray that right now in the privacy of your heart, wherever you're sitting right now, you can open up your heart to Jesus Christ. Let's pray right now. If you would like to be saved, pray a prayer like this from your heart. Just say, dear Jesus, I believe that you died on the cross. I believe you rose again. I believe you are alive. And I'm asking you to save me. Forgive me of my sin. Come into my heart and life right now. Just like Thomas, I believe. I believe in you, Jesus, and I trust you. You are the way to heaven. Take me to heaven when I die. In Jesus' name, amen. I hope that you just prayed that prayer and trusted Christ as your Savior. And if you've already trusted Christ, Man, we can really rejoice 
in the truths that we learn today from the life of the disciple Thomas. Jesus proved to Thomas that death can be beat. He proved to him that the resurrection is real. And he proved to Thomas that heaven can be found. And so I hope that that's been a blessing to you. I want to wish all of you a happy Resurrection Sunday. God bless you.